Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We are so pleased you're joining with us for this special Good Friday service. Uh, just a few notes before we get to the message. Uh, today's message is going to be very interactive with some times for response as we make our way through the story. So I just want to encourage you, as, we, as we're about to fade out and then come back to the message, if you want to just pause the video and grab some things you'll need. So we'll be taking communion together as part of the message. So uh, in a moment, uh, pause the video, grab uh, something to drink and something to eat that can represent the body and the blood of Christ. And we're also going to be uh, taking a moment to put our names on the cross as a, as a re- moment of reflection and time of response. So if you can grab a post-it note, uh, something you can stick to something, and then if you have a cross in your house, use it. If you have two pieces of wood, you can lay on top of your lay on top of each other to make a cross, do so. If you want to just grab a piece of paper and draw a cross and then write your name over it, uh, obviously if you're not in the building with a physical cross, you can be as creative as you need to be. But I just want to encourage you in this time, grab the elements of communion, have them ready, uh, grab a pen and some paper, have some stuff ready in order to symbolize your name and the cross, and then I'll give some instruction during the message as to why we're going to be responding in those ways and how we're going to do that. Uh, so take a moment, grab those now, and then we'll be back with the Good Friday message. Well, church, I've always, I've always found Good Friday to be a challenging day to prepare for. You know, especially when it comes to the tone. We live, we live in 2023, so we often, we look back and we th- see the cross through the lens of the empty grave. You know, we know how the story ends. So there's this, this innate desire to celebrate the victory that we know that we have. But also, maybe you have it as well, this, this nagging feeling that on Good Friday, it's just a, it's a little bit too premature to celebrate. It's a little bit too early still. It doesn't, doesn't quite fit the tone as we gather together today to remember. You know, it, it might be Good Friday, but it's not exactly Party Friday. And on the other side of the coin is this temptation to, to lean into the somberness, into the darkness, into the reality of the pain Jesus endured as he experienced what some consider to be one of the most horrific deaths known to man. You know, I remember years ago when um, the Passion of the Christ movie first came out. I remember going to see it in theaters uh, when it was first released. And, and throughout the scenes of Jesus' final moments, there were these two ladies seated behind me that just sobbed uncontrollably through those scenes. And, you know, I, I, I understand the expression of emotion in that moment. It was something quite intense to see it visually portrayed in front. But I, <laughs> on the other hand, I wanted to just turn and cry out, like, don't worry. He'll come back. It's going to be okay. And, you know, this, this is the challenge of Good Friday. It's balancing the tension between the death of, and the resurrection of Jesus, between the sacrifice and the victory, between despair and hope. As we gather today, church, do you feel that tension? You know, if you do feel it, we have to ask ourselves, what do we, what do, we do with this tension? How do we respond to this? And as uncomfortable as it may be, we have to enter into the tension and come face to face with the cross of Christ. We can't allow the grave to consume us. But we also can't be too quick in moving on to Sunday. We need to pause. We need to acknowledge and accept the weight of what transpired on Good Friday. We need to take time to remember, to contemplate, to recognize the great price that was paid for you and was paid for me. And in doing so, come to the realization of this very simple truth. The cross of Christ requires a response. So as we come to the cross today, let's pray, and then we'll get into the text. God, on this Good Friday, we take a moment. We pause. We remember the price that was paid. We remember your sacrifice. And we just want to take a moment and reflect on that to, to look once again to the text and to understand the weight of what transpired and what that means for us. So I pray you would help us to just set aside the things we came in with, that you would help us to set aside perhaps the eagerness we have to rush towards celebration and victory and just engage in the tension of this moment and recognize the gravity of what took place. 
and allow that to turn our hearts towards thankfulness and praise and ultimately a response to you. We ask and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, the biblical account of Jesus' final hours is reflected, of course, in all four Gospels and spread across multiple chapters of text. For today, for this year's Good Friday, I'd like us to zoom in and focus on one very specific part of the story. It's one of the most unique interactions, I would say, in all of Scripture. It's the conversation that takes place between Jesus and the two criminals who are crucified alongside of him. So in your Bibles, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 23? Luke 23, we're going to start in verse 32, reading reading through to verse 43. I'm reading in the ESV today. So it says this, it says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him that read, This is the king of the Jews. And now in verse 39, it says, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, why this account, you might ask? What significant insight do these verses hold for us today? Well, first and foremost, this text reminds us, once again, of the immense love that Jesus has for everyone and reveals to us just who this man was and why he came to earth. You know, picture it in your mind's eye, Jesus hanging on the cross, Jesus in the midst of unimaginable pain and suffering. I can only imagine uh, the effort it took to even speak while hanging there. Jesus being mocked and harassed by those who are watching this torture unfold. In the midst of that scene, Jesus continues to demonstrate a heart that is full of forgiveness for the people, that is full of mercy, that is full of grace, that is full of love. Even in his final moments, Jesus remained clear and focused on his divine purpose, the salvation of all who would come and believe. In those final moments, we once again see the promise of hope for the life to come, both on earth and in heaven. But more specifically, and the reason why I chose to look at this account today, this text This story of Jesus and the criminals is important because of our role in it. And you go, our role? Like, we're not traveling back in time. What do you mean our role in this? Well, for all intents and purposes, these criminals, the ones that hang on the right and left of Jesus, they represent you and they represent me. They are sinners who deserve their fate, unlike the innocent Jesus that hung next to them. And their responses both to Christ and their situation reveal the inclinations and the motivations of their hearts, which gives us insight into the state of our own hearts as well. And they clearly demonstrate the choice that lies before each of us when confronted by the cross. Anger or acceptance, disillusion or devotion, pain or paradise. The cross of Christ requires a response, and I want to create space for that to happen here today. So throughout the message, I'm going to pause a few times for us to engage in an activity responding to what we've just heard. You see, in our sin, like the two criminals, we deserved the cross. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. What we've earned for our sin nature, what we've earned for our wrongdoing, what we've earned for our transgressions against the Lord is death. 
But Jesus, in his great love and mercy, has turned the symbol of his death into the symbol of our hope in him. Because if you finish that verse, the latter half of 623 says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So today, response begins with recognizing the significance of the cross and our place on it alongside Jesus. So what I encourage you to do is, is have a representation of the cross nearby. Have paper, something you can write your name on. Here in the room, we have a large cross. We have post-it notes. So we're just going to take a moment, write our name on the post-it note, and then affix it to the cross. Recognizing the penalty that we each deserve for our sin, at the same time while praising Jesus for his love and mercy poured out upon us through the cross. So let's take a moment. The cross of Christ requires a response. Let's respond at this time by affixing our names to the cross and recognizing where we belong. as we come back to the message. Let's return to this interaction between Jesus and the criminals crucified alongside of him. Let's take some time to examine their responses in that moment. You see, the cross of Christ requires a response, and in that response, there is a revealing. There's a revealing of what's going on in here in our hearts. There's a revealing of our attitude. There's a revealing of our understanding. There's a revealing of our spiritual posture. We see it in the words spoken by the criminals, and we see it again in our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own meditations and inclinations when we come face to, the fa- face to face with the cross and all that it represents. To examine the words of the criminals is to examine the innermost voice inside of ourselves. Their words bring us face to face with our own fears, doubts, hopes, dreams, and, and thoughts about God himself. And yes, that may sound uncomfortable to some of us. Because it often is. But it's also incredibly appropriate for today, especially as the communion table stands before us as our next point of response. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes in regards to communion, the Lord's Supper. He says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Paul encourages us to have a personal examination of our heart before taking part in communion. And this is not meant to exclude people from participating, but rather to prepare people to receive the communion in the right way and with the right heart. So let's see what the words of the criminals reveal, both in their hearts and ours, and in doing so, examine ourselves as we prepare to come to the table of communion today. So I'm coming back to the text, Luke 23. We read the words of the first criminal starting in verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. Save yourself and us. Do something. You know, where have we heard this before? It's the, it's the same mocking question that was hurled at Jesus from both the rulers and the soldiers earlier in this passage. It's a, a taunting invitation for Jesus to prove to everyone who he really is. Right? What are they really saying there? They're saying, surely, surely if you're actually God, you will come down from there and save yourself. You know, God would never allow himself to be humiliated in this way. God would never allow himself to die on a cross. Are you kidding me? Come on, come off of there. And following that, follow, following that taunting invitation, that mocked tone, is this desperate demand from the criminal where he says, save me, save me. But here's the interesting thing. That first criminal, he wasn't crying out for the salvation that Jesus was offering. He didn't want salvation for his sins. In crying out, save me, he wanted salvation from the pain and the humiliation of that circumstance. Save yourself and us is better translated as get us off of these crosses and get us out of here. It's the cry of self-preservation and ultimately it's the cry of the arrogant. 
believing truly in his heart, I don't deserve to be here. Which, if you think about it, is perhaps the most tone-deaf statement to hang next to Jesus and to have the audacity to say, I, I don't deserve to be here. Ultimately, what we see in the response from this first criminal is a bitter heart. A heart that is angry at the fact that he's on a cross next to the man claiming to be God, but nothing is happening. Nothing is getting better from his perspective. You know, it's a bitter heart that says, God's not doing anything for me. God's not intervening. God is not able. So I'm going to ask us to take a moment and examine ourselves and examine our hearts. Is it possible that at one point or another you had the heart of arrogance at work within yourself? The heart that says, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve this. God's not doing anything about it. Get me out of here. Is it possible that you have the heart of arrogance within yourself today? Is it possible that you've logged into this service and in the back of your head you're thinking, I don't, I don't need Jesus. What has he ever done for me? You see, in his arrogance, the criminal was blind to the big picture. Jesus can't come off the cross. He has to remain there. It's only by staying on the cross and not saving himself that Jesus is able to save all of humanity from their sin, including, ironically, the criminal who wanted to come down from the cross and be saved. But in his arrogance, he's missed it. And so all of his bitterness and all of his anger just bubble to the surface and come out in this, get me off of here, save yourself and us. Are you not God? Come on. Church, don't, don't miss it. Don't allow a heart of arrogance and pride blind you to the power and the purpose of the cross. We need to let go of that and release it. And we come back to the text once again, pick him in verse 40, in verse 40. Let's look at the words of the second criminal. In response to the first, the second set, it says the second rebuked him, saying to the criminal, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We see in the words of this criminal, gets a completely different man. You know, he's, at first, he looks at the other criminal, and he's like, hey, man, man, hey, sh- what are you saying? Have you no respect for who this is next to us? Like, sh- cut it out. And he's like, second of all, think for a second. We do deserve to be here. He doesn't. We do. We broke the law. We're criminals. Absolutely we should be hung here. He should not. Where the first man mocked Jesus, this man showed him respect. Where the first man denied his own sin, this man acknowledged his wrongdoing. And where the first man was blind to the purpose of Christ on the cross, this man asked to be remembered in the kingdom of God. Did you catch that? Did you catch that last part? Because it's absolutely remarkable. This criminal, the second one, he doesn't ask Jesus to physically save him. His response is completely different. He doesn't start asking Jesus, hey, get me out of here. Hey, save me. You know, that's not what he asks. Nor does he decide to spit in the face of Jesus and mock him. He humbly accepts the consequences of his crime. He acknowledges the innocence of Jesus. And then he makes one simple request. He says, please remember me, Jesus. Please remember me. When you enter, when you enter in your kingdom, please don't forget about me. And that phrase that he uses in the original language, it's essentially a prayer for favor. He's asking Jesus in that moment, can you please acknowledge me as one of your followers? In essence, he's making a statement of faith in Jesus Christ in that very moment, saying, please remember me. Count me as one of your followers. Have favor on me, Lord. And this one phrase, in this one phrase, we see that this criminal believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be. This criminal recognized Jesus as the Messiah. Remember me expresses hope in a future kingdom and claims the blessing the Lord has promised to those who would believe. Ultimately, what we see in the response from the second criminal is a contrite, a remorseful, a repentant heart. It's as if he's saying, here I am a sinner, broken and in need of you. Have mercy on me, Jesus. 
where the other criminal couldn't see the big picture, the second understood at least a portion of what was transpiring as they hung there next to one another. He began to see God is at work in this moment. God is for me. God is able. So once again, I'm going to ask us, can we take a moment and examine ourselves? Are you coming to the cross and the table of communion today with a humble and a contrite heart? Are you coming with a heart that whispers, Jesus, here I am, a sinner, broken, in need of you. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? As you come to the cross and the table this morning, do you see the big picture? It had to happen this way. It could only happen this way. Jesus died so that we may live. He sacrificed himself so that we may reign with him forever in his kingdom. God is able, and the work of the cross changes everything for you and for me. Once again, the cross of Christ requires a response, and this time, the response is the table of communion, the remembrance of his death and the declaration of his sacrifice. I'll bring us back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. This is where Paul writes to the church regarding how we are to take the Lord's Supper. And he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. This is why we're taking time this morning. We're making this meaningful. We're going to pause. We're not going to rush through this. We're going to examine ourselves. I want to encourage you in this moment, just before we come to communion, take a moment, examine yourself, reflect, reflect on the words of the two criminals. You know, ask yourself, who do I most represent? You know, who do, who, who do, who do I hear my voice coming out of the most? You know, what's the state of my heart today? Am I finding myself full of arrogance and full of pride? Am I often like standing on the I don't deserve this box? Or am I, am I the second criminal going, I deserve this. I am a sinner. I did mess up. Jesus did not deserve this. Christ, please remember me. Forgive me. Have mercy on me. So take a moment. Examine yourself. Reflect on the story. And then when you're ready, I want to encourage you to grab the elements and take communion together. I have my elements here. So as you take a moment to reflect, I'm just going to get my stuff ready. Grab the bread or whatever you have to represent bread. You just pray along with me. God, we thank you. We thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you for the price that you paid for each one of us, you died so that we may live. God, in this moment, as we have examined our hearts, as we have, we have made sure to remove anything which tries to get in the way of what you're doing, anything that tries to declare that you aren't capable of a miraculous work, we move that out of the way and we come to you in humility, we come to you in contrition, we recognize our sin, we recognize our wrongdoing, we say, Lord, have mercy on me. Remember me in this moment. Count me as one of your followers. Let's break the bread and eat together. And then take the cup. Whatever you have to drink in this moment. And pray along with me. Jesus, we thank you for your blood poured out for us. We thank you for your sacrifice. 
Thank you as the blood pours out, it's so symbolic of your love that pours over us, of your grace and your mercy that pours over us. Yes, we are sinners. Yes, we are broken in need of you. But God, in this moment, because of your sacrifice, you have poured out, you have lavished love and grace and mercy on us. You have covered all those things. You have declared that we are forgiven. And you've drawn us close to you. So God, I pray that in this moment we would recognize that. We would stand in that truth. And God, that we would feel your comfort and your closeness. We ask and praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, let's drink. So as we come to a close today, one last thought. We've examined the response of each criminal to Jesus and their situation. But the story is not complete unless we look at Jesus' response to the criminals. Now, the first criminal receives no response from Jesus that we know of. I mean, we don't know if we have the entire story, but we don't see anything in the text regarding how he responded to the first criminal. Rather, the first criminal ends up being silenced by the second. He rebukes him, saying, have you no respect for who we're, who we're next to? But Jesus does respond to the second criminal's request. And it's in the form of a promise that exceeds all expectations. Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the criminal on the cross had simply said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he had said. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, No, truly I say to you, today you'll be, you'll be with me in paradise. Though the criminal had some future time in mind, Jesus told him, today. Though the criminal asked only to be remembered, Jesus said, you will be with me. And though he looked only for a kingdom, Jesus promised him paradise. And here's the thing. This promise of Jesus is as true for you and me today as it was for the criminal on the cross next to Jesus. The cross requires a response. And in our response, Jesus meets us with a promise a promise that our eternity is secured in him, that he's prepared a paradise for us, a promise that in this very moment he'll be with us no matter what we're going through, and a, pr- and a promise that is for right now, today. He's not giving us a rain check to catch in the future. He's saying, no, in this very moment, I'll be with you. In this very moment, your eternity is secured. In this very moment, you can step into the fullness of life that I created you for. It's an incredible promise. So as we respond to the cross today. He meets us with this promise. My encouragement to you today, church, receive the promise he has for you. Step into all that he has for you. The cross of Christ requires a response. In that response, let's lay hold of the promise that he has for us. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you once again for all that today represents. For the cross, for your death, for your sacrifice, for the price you paid. And God, I pray that as we have responded this morning, as we have recognized our name on the cross, as we have taken communion and partaken in that together, as we have declared who you are and what you've done, God, I pray that we will in this moment see the promise you have for us and lay hold of it. That we would recognize that you are not far off, that the promise is not a future range yet to cash in on, that you are very much with us today in this moment, that you have secured our eternity in this moment, and that you have a full life for each one of us to live starting right now in this very moment. We thank you and we praise you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We thank you for joining with us today for our Good Friday service, church. Just a reminder that on Easter Sunday, we have two services. There's a 7 a.m. outdoor sunrise service at the Watershed Park, and then our regular service at 9.30 a.m. here in the church building. We'd love to have you come out and celebrate with us the victory, the resurrection, the biggest party of the year. It's Easter Sunday. Come join us on Sunday. We'd love to see you there. Have a wonderful weekend.